I teach chemistry at many different levels. And no matter which class I'm teaching, my regular chemistry classes all the way up to my AP classes, I want to make sure I finish what I'm starting. It's like um, going through teaching a chemistry class, sort of like reading a mystery novel. And if you don't read the last chapter to figure out who done it, then you're really missing something. Even if I wind up short on time at the end of the year, this is a demonstration I will end my classes with in my regular chemistry classes. It deals with electrochemistry. And the word electrochemistry some, sometimes strikes fear into the heart of any teacher. It shouldn't. Whether you realize it or not, you've probably been teaching electrochemistry all year long. What we have here is a Hoffman apparatus. And for this particular experiment, I'm going to be using, well, I'm not sure if I want to tell you, and that's exactly the way I say it to my students. I'm going to do the electrolysis of water. Now there's a problem with that. Water is not a very good conductor. And so I need something that is going to allow me to electrolyze the water and break it up into smaller particles. What I add to my water to me is critical. A lot of people may add sulfuric acid, but it changes things. So what I like to do is use a solution of sodium sulfate, 0.1 molar sodium sulfate. And I'm going to add to the sodium sulfate an indicator. Now, here again, this can be a little different. But for me, with the sodium sulfate, 0.1 molar, my indicator of choice would not be universal for what I want to do. I think to see the reactions I'm interested in, I want to use some bromthymol blue. Bromthymol blue is going to be yellow in an acid, blue in a base, and green at, at its transition point, which is around pH 7. So a couple of good squirts of bromthymol blue. This is always fun, going into a new lab and looking to see what color the water is, even with the sodium sulfate added. Now think about it. Sodium sulfate is a salt, but it is going to be a neutral salt. It should then give me sort of a greenish color in water. And I want to make sure that I'm seeing this well, so I'm going to hold this up against this background. I may want just a little bit more of a green color than this. I'm afraid to add too much acid to it, though. I'm going to let it go for just a second and hope that this is what I need. I'm going to pour the uh, bromthymol blue solution with the sodium sulfate into the, um, into the uh, Hoffman apparatus. Here both valves are open so that when I pour, I can see it better now. This is a nice green solution down at the bottom of the tubes. I want to fill both arms of the Hoffman apparatus all the way up to the top. I think this is perfect. I was worried that there wouldn't be enough there. Get this little air bubble rising to the top there. Okay. At this point, I'm going to close both valves. And I have a DC power supply here. I'm going to put my red lead, attach it here, my black here, hmm. OK, I think we're set up and ready to run. Power supply is here, ready to go. Now all I'm going to do is ask my students to make observations. I think that's the heart of everything I want them to do in, the, in any laboratory that I'm doing. Look, what do they see? 
and be very careful with your observations. So we're going to turn on the power supply and then slowly turn up the, the voltage here until I begin to see a reaction. And I want you to look and see what are the first changes that you see. Mm -hmm. I think it's just starting. I can see it more clearly in this side of the Hoffman apparatus. And it might help, just real quickly, I'm going to put hold a board up behind the Hoffman apparatus. Maybe that will make the colors more distinct. Okay, my students are jumping because they see something that they know all about. They understand acid-base indicators. This is something we've talked about in class, so this isn't anything new to them. They see the acid base indicators. And one of the first observations, a student's going to raise his hand and say, ah, ah, I see a change, I see a change. And I'll say, what is it? And the first change they normally see is the beautiful blue coloration. Now, this is occurring at the black lead. So I want to record that, that I have a blue coloration at the black lead. And it takes just a little bit longer before they notice that on the other arm of the Hoffman apparatus, they have the yellow coloration. This is occurring at the red lead. I'm just writing down my observations. For a while, that may be all the students say, but upon careful observation, if they look at the bottom of the, of the uh, Hoffman apparatus, there are two platinum electrodes. And if you can focus in on the two electrodes, what's happening at those two electrodes? Can you see it? Bubbles are being produced. Bubbles are being produced, however, at both electrodes. Make your observations. Can you tell a difference in the amount of gases being produced? You've got to be able to see this because on one side of the Hoffman apparatus, you're going to have more bubbles than on the other. While I'm writing down the fact that we have bubbles on both sides, where do we have more bubbles? Okay. My Hoffman apparatus has a slightly larger platinum electrode, but if you're looking at this, the greater number of bubbles is probably going to be seen here on the, what would be your left-hand side of the Hoffman apparatus. What if you can't detect this? Is there another way that you could look for greater production of gas? It may take a little bit longer but we could also focus just below the valves here. If we focus below the valves, as the gas is being produced at the electrodes, gases being less dense are going to rise to the top of the sides, and the gases are going to be collected at the top of the tubes. Now, if you can focus right here at the top of both tubes, could we make an observation? Hmm, which one seems to be collecting more gases? Would it be the black lead where we see the blue color? Or would it be the yellow side where we have the red lead? Well, from my observations, I'm thinking it's going to be on the yellow side. What do you think? We'll let it run for just a little bit longer just to make sure, since we're having some difficulty detecting the number of bubbles here uh, at the platinum electrodes, we'll wait and collect more gas. Now I'm going to let this run for a while. And what we're going to do is we're going to move to the board. 
And I'm going to put my observations here at the easel for us to refer to occasionally. All right? We've made these observations that from the black lead, we have a blue coloration that's very obvious, and we know that we're producing a gas. Bubbles are seen there. At the red lead, we see yellow. Our color is yellow for the indicator, brown thymol blue. And we also have bubbles being produced there. Well, just based on these observations, you can do a lot of chemistry. What we're going to do now, moving to the board, is look at the reactions. I tell my students that in both cases, what we're looking at is the decomposition of water. So we want to write that water is being decomposed. This is the reaction that is going to be occurring at both electrodes. Now, what observations will help us write the products of this reaction? At the black lead, remember that we saw the blue color, and we know that bromthymol blue gives us a blue coloration when we have a base being produced, hydroxide ions. So I'm going to write that I have some hydroxide ions here because I see the blue coloration. And at the red lead, I see the yellow, indicating the presence of an acid. So I know that some sort of an acid is being produced here because of my visual observation of the yellow color. Now, let's take another quick shot of the Hoffman apparatus and let's see if we can look at the top of these two arms and make any decisions on how much gas is being produced. I think there's a little bubbling here that's deceiving me. And I'm looking just at the number of bubbles. And from my point of view, from my point of view, as I'm looking at the bubbles rising, it seems like I have a lot more bubbles in the blue side, OK? Just by the number of bubbles moving up through the column. And I'm not sure if that would show up on, on the video. OK. Well, what would that tell me? Hmm. If I have more bubbles here, more gas being produced here, then this is going to be, I'm predicting that this is going to be my hydrogen gas. We're going to test for that in just a little bit. And if the hydrogen gas is being produced here, then the oxygen gas will be produced here. So I'm putting that onto the board based on the number of bubbles, the amount of gas that I see being produced at each of the electrodes. All right. So just by visual observations now, I have got my reactants and my products. What do we teach any student to do at this point? Well, a good equation is not a good equation unless it's properly balanced, right? So the first thing I want to do is balance with respect to the number of atoms. Two hydrogens here, three hydrogens here. How could I balance that? Maybe if I put a 2 in front of my water and put a 2 in front of the hydroxides, that's going to give me four hydrogens on both sides. It also gives me two oxygens. So my equation is balanced as far as atoms are concerned. Let's do the same thing over here on the right. Here's water decomposing into hydrogen and oxygen. I think my first problem is going to be these two oxygens. Let's put a 2 here. And then I would need a 4 in front of my hydronium ion symbol in order to have that balance with respect to the atoms. Now, after we balance that, I'm going to kind of separate these two just to make sure that we know where they end. I need to balance with respect to charge. And I do not have the same charges on each side. On this right-hand side, I have two negative charges. Well, I have no negative charges here. And the only way I can balance these equations is going to be by moving electrons. So I'm going to say that I'm going to need, right now, two electrons on the left-hand side. These two electrons, two negative charges, would balance out the two negative charges on the right. Here, 
the only way I can balance is with electrons again. And so this side is neutral. I think here I would have to have four electrons to negate the four positive charges here so that both sides of my equation would be neutral. My children know how to balance equations. But they see that there's still a problem because over here I have two electrons and on the right four electrons I've got to move the same number of electrons. So I need to make some changes with this left equation. If I'm going to make these changes, what I want to do is move the same number of electrons. So if I'm going to change this to four electrons, I'm going to have to multiply my entire equation by two. So this is going to give me four waters. This is going to give me four hydroxides. And this is going to give me two hydrogens. Okay, now I'm feeling better. We're balanced with respect to atoms, we're balanced with respect to charges, and we're balanced with respect to the number of electrons that's being moved. Okay, let's see if we can kind of think about what's going on here. At this point, I see that at the black electrode, I'm gaining electrons. Gaining electrons. Grr. Gaining electrons is where reduction occurs. And so a reduction is occurring at the black lead. So this is my reduction. And reduction always occurs at the cathode. I tell my students in class that I have a red cat. So reduction is going to be occurring at the cathode. And so here we have the reduction side of our reaction. Reduction at the cathode. All right, what's happening at the red lead? At the red lead, electrons are being given off. Electrons are being lost. Losing electrons, oxidation. All right, losing electrons, this is where the oxidation reaction is occurring. The decomposition of water involved is a redox reaction as well as a decomposition because we're having these charges changing as the electrons are moving. Oxidation occurs at the anode. All right, so we have identified our cathode and our anode at this point. And we could even go ahead and check for charges. Now, normally, in a spontaneous reaction, I would think that my cathode is going to be positive. But this reaction isn't spontaneous. Water doesn't spontaneously decompose, does it? The only way this water is being decomposed for us to see is by using the power supply. We're forcing this reaction. We're driving it in the opposite direction from the spontaneous one. And so the cathode is not going to be positive. Here, our cathode is going to be our negative charged lead. Think about it. The black lead coming from the power supply, negative charge, and our anode is going to be positively charged. So we've identified the anode and the cathode, the type of the reaction that's going to occur there, and the charges on both of the electrodes. Now, what I know is that when an oxidation reduction reaction occurs, they both have to occur at the same time. So I want to put these two reactions together. I'm simply going to copy these two reactions down, and let's take this one first. It says that four waters plus four electrons will yield four hydroxide ions and two water, two hydrogens, sorry. Okay, I think I've got everything there. The second reaction is going to read that I have two waters and that is going to produce four hydroniums an oxygen and four electrons are going to be lost. Now, 
when you take these two half reactions, we're going to sum the two half reactions. We're going to take the reduction and the oxidation and put them together. Okay, well, we can see that these four electrons are going to be removed from our final equation. And so we wind up with this, that six waters are going to yield, I'm going to sort of rearrange, four hydronians, four hydroxides, two hydrogens, and oxygen. I don't think I've missed anything. Can you see where we're going? Well, let's see. We know that hydroniums and hydroxides like to come together to produce neutral water molecules. So if these come together, they would produce four waters, four water molecules, which would cross out, cancel out four here of the water molecules. And this would leave me with two H2Os yields two hydrogens and an oxygen. And that's what I teach is the reaction for the decomposition of water. Very early in the school year when I'm talking about types of reactions, before I want to go into redox chemistry, I'll talk about composition, decomposition, single and double displacements. And here I have a decomposition reaction. I'm showing the decomposition reaction of water here. And yet it's not as simple as just breaking it up. Later on, when we've learned a little more chemistry, we want to come back and understand the half reactions. And by using the Hoffman apparatus, let's go back. By using the Hoffman apparatus, it's easy to take and make your visual observations. I'm not doing anything I haven't done before. I want them to look and make observations, observe the colors, put to use the acid-base chemistry they've learned, balance equations, look at a little stoichiometry, and it's all here in this one reaction. You don't have to call it electrochemistry. You can call it a review of the entire school year almost, but this is a good lead-in into electrochemistry. Or it's a great finish at the end of the school year just to summarize so many topics that you've covered previously. At this point, you can observe that there's definitely more gas collected in the left-hand arm of the Hoffman apparatus than in the right-hand arm. We would predict the identity of these two gases based on the stoichiometry, the ratios, maybe twice as much of one gas in one side than in the other, but let's test for it. I'm going to ask for Jeff to assist me with this real quickly. We're simply going to take a small test tube, put it above the opening to the Hoffman apparatus here. I'm going to open the valve. You can see, do it real slowly so that you can see the levels of the liquid rise in this side arm. So whatever gas was there is now in my test tube. And all we're going to do is a, a test here for the gas and see what we get. one of those. Didn't seem to glow. Not a real good test for either of the gases, but we're going to try the other one. All right. Let's take, collect this gas. And we're going to do the typical test for hydrogen gas bringing it to the mouth of the bottle at the top, at the, of the test tube at the top. Okay, here we go. There's our hydrogen bark. So we've identified that the gas in the blue end of the Hoffman apparatus is indeed hydrogen. If we had tested this for hydrogen, we wouldn't have gotten any bark at all. There was so little amount, such a little amount of oxygen there that it was hard to get a good oxygen test by having it reignite a splint.